Today I want to talk a bit about uh, JavaScript and where it's going and what we're doing with it. I'm not going to go into technical details, although a lot of people ask me to do that, but there is a good reason for it, which I'm going to explain halfway during my presentation. Uh, yesterday, now yesterday evening, I saw the closing keynote, and there I learned that it's very important that if you make statements, that you back them up with uh, inspirational quotes from uh, people from history. So I thought about that too, and thought about the people that formed me and the people that inspired me, and one of them was Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, or Guthi, as Americans pronounce him. And he was a, a visionary. He was a statesman. He was a writer. He was a philosopher. And I think one of the quotes that uh, inspired me a lot that he did in 1802 was, um, humans shall strive for nothing less but excellence, for this is what gives them the most satisfaction. And this is why relying on automatic semicolon insertion is not an option. <laughs> it just shows how much of a genius he was that he predicted a lot of what JavaScript would do in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, even 20 years before it was invented. And it, it, st it stuck with me, and I thought this is a good idea to strive for that kind of excellence. So today I want to talk to you about JavaScript, and I mostly want to talk to you about why I'm so excited about it. And I've been working with JavaScript for 20 years almost, 17 years, something like that. I made a lot of money writing JavaScript things that I'm not at all proud of, you know, DHTML menus and form validation things that don't make any sense. And then after professionally using JavaScript for six, seven years, I wrote my first JavaScript book, and then I started understanding the language, which is something that a lot of people will have had the same experience, because we just do a lot of stuff in JavaScript without knowing what we're doing. JavaScript is an incredibly versatile language. That's what I love about it. It's available web-wide and across many platforms, and it's toolset independent. That's why I more or less started with it. I, I, I needed a text editor. I didn't need the Borland C++ builder or Java Eclipse kind of thing. It's like anything would do. I, I, I think I used a DOS editor at one time, like, and then I used like a text pad for years, and nowadays I use Sublime Text. And it's forgiving and inviting. And for a lot of developers, this sounds like a very weird thing. Like a, a, a variable in JavaScript can be a number, can be turned into a string, can be a dog, a submarine, whatever you want the variable to be, JavaScript is okay with that. And a lot of people coming from languages where this is not as forgiving just never see JavaScript as a sensible language because of that. You can use JavaScript in browsers on the web. That's the main use case. This is when browsers supported JavaScript. Out of a sudden, you didn't have to reload pages to show error messages. You could do it directly without having to do an HTTP request and do all the loading. You can now use it on the server as well. With Node.js, we'd made the jump to the server. We had LiveScript before that as well, in Netscape only in 1997 or something like that, which luckily enough died really quickly. And then we had it in applications. Many people don't know that, but a lot of applications, especially on Windows, were running in JScript with more, more or less JavaScript with just random words thrown inside it. And you could, for example, uh, script Illustrator as well. I built a few things in Illustrator with JavaScript. and that was a normal thing to do. You can access services with it. You can use it as a data format, JSON, and you can use it on hardware, like the Tessel is an engine that runs a hardware piece that runs on JavaScript. And your turn surprised me. JavaScript will be applicable to almost every platform out there, so if you want to run it on your fridge, on your car, on your dog, or your children, please do it and, uh, and write blog posts about it and tell me what, how it was. And it's in super high demand. If you do a Google search for undefined is not a function, which is one of the things that only JavaScript gives you, you will see that over the years it became bigger and bigger. Out of a sudden, a lot of people had to learn JavaScript and ran into mistakes and didn't know what to do with them, so they asked Google, and Google told them something. Now, here's a blanket statement. Um, you will have to deal with JavaScript sooner or later. It will come across you, because it, it has taken over the market. It's the fastest growing language out there. It's the most applicable language in different environments. And it's simple to learn, hard to understand. But the simple to learn thing is what makes people get into JavaScript really, really quickly. I'm also very happy that at a time where it's 30 degrees outside, the giveaway was a blanket. So I'm like, yay. <laughs> I, I feel really warm. Let's have a blanket. But I'm going back to England, so I will need it. I hope it's waterproof. Um, we're going full speed on innovation right now. There are so many things being done on the web that I'm not going to go through right now, but all of them are interesting to look at. 
WebGL, WebAssembly, PostCSS, uh, WebVR I haven't gotten in there, like virtual reality using JavaScript. There's so many things out there that you can take a look at right now. Some of them are weird, like PostCSS, for example, is running CSS in JavaScript, so you have full control over every selector, which sounds to me dangerous, but people want it, so eh, whatever. The flexibility of JavaScript makes all of this possible. It's the language that is this chameleon of the web or the chameleon of languages that allows you to do whatever with it and run it on a very, very simple environment, a very sm a small environment. The only problem is we never knew how much memory it needed before we had developer tooling that nowadays give us this insight. And this sounds great, of course, if you know JavaScript and it is available. If you don't, then it sounds like, oh my god, I have to learn something I don't want to learn. That sounds like a terrible language. Now here's a quick reminder how JavaScript is pretty much the odd one out when it comes to languages. JavaScript is technically not a great language for the web. The web was built to be independent of hardware, independent of software, independent of ability, independent of geo geographical location. That's why when you go to YouTube and it tells you that this video is not available in your country, I get angry because this is not supposed to be what the web is about. That's also when a movie gets released in America and then takes half a year to be released in England and the film industry blames the piracy for loss of money. No, you just released it with half a year delay and made, gave the pirates half a year to release it on the internet. How about you release it on the internet up front? But the problem with JavaScript is that it's not forgiving. HTML and CSS are both fault tolerant. When HTML you write something in there that doesn't exist, like flugelhorn or something. It just says, meh, I don't care. This is an HTML element that I don't know. I just show you the text inside it and hope that's OK. And CSS does the same thing. If you write some CSS that the browser doesn't understand, it just skips that line and goes to the next one. JavaScript, on the other hand, is not fault tolerant. That's why you have these websites that show you things like that for 15 minutes and you wonder what's going on and you have no idea what went wrong. So one simple mistake and nothing shows up. The good thing is that only paranoid freaks turn off JavaScript. That everybody else has JavaScript available the whole time. We all have cool computers on fast connections. JavaScript is always there. That's why we can rely on it. Not so much. Uh, this is uh, a depiction of a normal person that turns off JavaScript according to Stack Overflow. Uh, Stuart Langridge, talking about grumpy old men, uh, is a good friend of mine and a very, very good JavaScript developer that has been cropping up for years and years. He beat me by one week writing the first Ajax book. I wrote the, the one that explained Ajax in detail. He just had a chapter of Ajax in his book. His publisher was a bit faster than me. And he has this great website that says everyone has JavaScript right, explaining what can go wrong before a JavaScript gets executed on the computer of your end user. All of these things can go wrong and will go wrong before your JavaScript gets executed. So saying like every, all of my users have JavaScript is absolute nonsense. And this sounds kind of familiar. When XHTML2 was a thing and we said, oh, XHTML is not clever enough, we need it to be modular and complex and XML based because that's what people want, we found out that one single encoding mistake would give you the uh, red error, uh, the yellow screen of death. So one ampersand that some ad, pl uh, some ad company puts in your HTML and out of a sudden the page is not shown anymore. And uh, as developers we said this is nonsense, this is absolutely unnecessary. We don't want to punish our end users for some mistake that we haven't even written. So mistakes happen, the end user should not be punished. That's why we came up with HTML5. The HTML5 parser is much more forgiving and inserts not closing tags in there and inserts a body element if you didn't have one of those. Puts all the magical things around your code when you're too lazy to type it in because you haven't understood what HTML is about. So we said it's not fair that by one mistake our end users don't get any, uh, any display or any page at all and then we rely on JavaScript that has many, many options to not ex uh, execute to run our web pages. So JavaScript abuse is absolutely rampant. This is nasa.gov on a fast connection. It's white until the page starts loading, so it's three seconds. Then we got about nine seconds of black screen and then something starts popping up. 
And this is not on a mobile device, this is on a desktop. On a mobile device, it's probably even longer. This is not a good experience. This is not the web of 2015, I think. And NASA.gov should be people that know about technology of sorts and actually are really good. Because I, uh, I wondered what was going on. And it's three megabyte, three megabyte of blocking JavaScript before the first page appears, before the first letters of the page appear. And three megabyte is quite a chunk. I was in Albania the other day, and on my mobile, the roaming was 12 pound for 10 megabyte. So the NASA website would cost me like, I don't know, 15 pound or something to load. I hope it's really, really good for that. Now, why does this happen? The NASA are very intelligent people and know about computers and know about programming. And I used to work on Yahoo Answers, and one of the questions there was, do you think NASA invented thunderstorms to cover up the sound of space battles? They might. I mean, we all know the CIA invented gravity to keep us down. <laughs> but NASA are not stupid. They just had to release the thing. And somebody somewhere was asked to do a shortcut and get the thing out of the door because the press release was already written and saying like, oh, we have a new website. Stop breaking things. Of course, I had to analyze it. So I downloaded the JavaScript, gave it an appropriate name, and started looking what was going on there. It turns out they had used a package manager or a, 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 a task runner like Grunt, Gulp, Barb, Fert, Fart, whatever they're called nowadays, and put lots of JavaScript together in one file, which is a good thing with HTTP. With HTTP2, we don't need to do that anymore, but we're not quite there yet. What they forgot, though, is minifying it. So it's all full of massive comments and all full of things that you don't need and lots of, lots of library bits in there that, you, that are never used in the page. I ran it through Uglyfy and then it's actually one megabyte. And with GZIP it probably goes down to 600, 700K. It's still a lot of JavaScript and it should be asynchronously loaded rather than just blocking, but it's better than three megabyte. So just one switch in the, in the, uh, in the task runner made that difference that he had three megabyte that was blocking the web. And this is one big issue we have in the web community. JavaScript is too powerful for its own good. Every time you run into a CSS layout issue and you get, get co uh, confused about CSS, people write a JavaScript to fix that. Not a good idea, but it is possible. Almost everything that goes wrong can be controlled to a degree fixed with JavaScript. I've done that over and over again. In DHTML, it was the only way to do it, to render something in Internet Explorer 6 and Netscape 4 that looked the same on both browsers rather than, rather than going crazy. And this leads to people relying on libraries and frameworks. That's why NASA used Ember and jQuery and a few others inside that thing because they didn't want to think about all these issues. And then they used the task manager to put it together and then they forgot to minify it. We use code we don't understand to fix issues we don't have. Because JavaScript libraries always pr tell us like, ooh, everything has, be has been thought of. Everything scales to infinity now. Your things will run 60 frames per second on every device that you will ever, never encounter. And I think that's a very dangerous kind of thinking. As developers, we always think it's a clever way, a clever idea to predict what will come. But turns out humans are really shit at predicting the future. You know, if we were better at that, then we wouldn't kick robots in videos. Because if the, if, like, you know, these videos of, uh, of, of Google, when they always see these fighting robots and they kick them so they don't fall over, and they just show that they can even themselves out. When the robot rising happens, they're going to remember that we kicked them. <laughs> treat, treat robots nice now, then you won't be killed in the future, is what I'm saying. So leading, learning libraries and frameworks beyond Hello World costs time and money. Many people don't understand that. They say, oh, we just use a library and our engineers know that, right? No, they have to learn that library and they have to learn something that might not be available in the future and might be gone. Time you don't spend on looking at optimizing your code. This is, you don't optimize the final outcome because you just rely on libraries and have to learn that library. In essence, we value developer convenience over user experience, and that is terrible. The web is there for us to deliver content and experiences to end users. We are truckers of the web. We're truckers of data that bring things to our end users. Everything else is not important. Us writing 50 lines of code instead of two lines of code 
if the experience for the end user is better, we bloody well should write 50 lines of code because it's a job. We are paid for doing that. Not everything we do in a job has to be fun. Not everything we do in a job has to be convenient. That's why we get paid for it. Our end user's happiness is what we should think about, not how easy it is for us to reach a thing that works almost good on our computer and our connectivity. Building libraries and frameworks that magically fix things have become fashionable. Like in the past, we had like JavaScript developers were, com were talking to each other about products that we build. Nowadays, we build products for other JavaScript developers because probably our bosses don't give us the appreciation that we want to have, so we try to impress one another. We work around browser issues, we make web standards of tomorrow work today, we build solutions to clean up our, other, uh, our others and make them smaller. And each of those comes with a don't use in production label. I love these libraries, they're like, oh, here's five lines of code that do this and that, and it's really easy and it makes these works on all these browsers and then don't use in production. Why do we build them then? Why do we build something that you don't use in production? That's like building a car without tires. Like, yeah, well look how beautiful it is, but you can't drive it. That's not a really good idea. Simply because you can fix anything with JavaScript does not mean you should. JavaScript has become this sticky tape of the web, where it's like, if it's wrong, use JavaScript. If the DOM is slow, let's make a virtual DOM and do everything in, in this one. If uh, CSS is too hard for you to understand, let's make a JSON notation of CSS so you can actually write colors and fonts in every single div on your page that are really hard to maintain afterwards. So my goal for today is to, to help you learn JavaScript in a responsible way and a way to stay up to date. Because it is overwhelming what's happening right now, like Hacker News and all kind of things have a JavaScript library a minute. And by the time you're trying it out for the first time, there's already the first blog post saying you don't use that. That's terrible. So we feel inadequate. We feel like overwhelmed and we feel like I'm too slow for this. I'm old. I should become a goat farmer. So let's fix, it, let's fix things at the source. Uh, I think the first problem that we have is the JavaScript learning process. That has always been interesting. The JavaScript learning process has always been interesting. Use view source to see what others are doing. This is what we did, 1997, 1998. Then copy and paste the bits that look like they are responsible for some things, change some numbers around, and run into errors. And then blame Internet Explorer. Of course, this was not a professional way of working. This was just hacking random things together, so we became more professional. We searched for a solution on Stack Overflow, we copy and paste the bits that look like they're responsible for some things, we change some numbers around, we run into errors, and we blame JavaScript for being a terrible and not a real language, and for good measure, we also blame Internet Explorer. <laughs> I call this the full Stack Overflow developer. People who copy and paste random things from Stack Overflow and then complain that it doesn't work and ask until people fix the code for them. And people who just charge money for the things that they don't understand either. And I think you're better than that. We should all be better than that. Like copying things you don't understand into a product and then going up to the product manager and saying like, yeah, well, it's done. Hey, you're so amazing as a developer. And you're like, oh God, I, I stole everything that you're just seeing here. And he <laughs> praises me for it. You know, it's a terrible, terrible feeling. There's no lack of free online resources for learning JavaScript. This is not 1996 anymore. This is not where you have to buy the Rhino book, the big one to go through it. There's online courses, there's talks, there's free eBooks. All of these things are there. Please, if you look at those things, look at the date and when they were written as well. Don't Write, uh, read a JavaScript uh, documentary from, from 2001 and wonder why JavaScript still sucks. There's new ones all the time and good ones as well. There's Udacity courses, there's Udemy courses and all the U whatever's out there. Um, Google does some really good stuff. Yahoo has some really good documentation. Mozilla Developer Network, of course, is the number one resource for everything on the web. W3 Schools is the spawn of Satan. Never go there, never, learn, never trust anything you read there, just go on and with your life and, and pretend it does not exist. Learn by doing and playing with the language. If you, uh, if you don't know it, analyze it. If you see something that works and you don't know why, think of Harry Potter, you know, when like Ron, uh, uh, Ron Weasley's father said, like, if you don't know where its brain is and it does something, don't trust it. It's the same with code. If you don't know what the thing does and you just copy and paste it in over and over again, you're probably doing something wrong. 
and share your knowledge because when you teach, you end up learning. As I said, I learned JavaScript when I wrote my first JavaScript book because I had no excuse anymore. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was writing the thing and then people, my editor asked me, so how does this work? And I'm like, I'm gonna come back to you. Because uh, you, you have no excuse of saying like, I, it just works. You have to explain why it works. And uh, uh, starting to give talks inside your company, starting to give talks to your colleagues is a very stress-free way to get to become someone like me standing here and talking to all of you people. And seeing the talks that were here at the conference yesterday, I feel like a complete idiot. I, I work for Microsoft. I have no idea what half the talks are here about because I never looked at these technologies. But I'm working there because I'm a web guy that they needed for some open source work. And I'm like, okay, so let's learn it, these things as well. Yesterday at the, at the hotel, we talked about language analysis and all these clever computing things. And I was just sitting there like, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can si I can ride my bike. These kind of things, you know, but don't feel bad about not being as clever as other people because we love to show off to each other and we love to impress one another with big words. You don't need to do that. Just be somebody who builds cool things and have fun with those. The second removing, uh, the second uh, fixing the source is removing scapegoats. Everybody talks that tooling on the web is shit. And it's not true anymore. And I'm not going to go into details about this, but developer tools and browsers are outstanding and gives us incredible insights. If you look at the developer tools in Firefox, the developer tools in Chrome, for the Chrome one, you almost need books to understand what the thing is doing. You've got by step-by-step -step debugging, you've got your CSS simulation, you can simulate different devices, you can debug across different devices. It's amazing what you can do with those things. The, we're redesigning the F12 developer tools for Microsoft now as well, Make, doing a different approach. So we don't just copy what the others are doing, we're just thinking what do developers really need. So if you have input for us, please tell us about it because we want to build tools for you. And uh, yeah, we even have time travel debugging, all the kind of cool stuff that you never saw in other developer tools. We can debug across devices and even convert HTML5 to native and closed systems. Manifold.js and Warload.js allows you to debug on other devices using WebSockets and Manifold allows you to create a binary iOS or Android file from HTML5. How cool is that? And editors have linting, built integration, and some are even written in JavaScript and run in the browser. I love that I type JavaScript and I see the errors that my JavaScript has while I'm typing it, rather than having to wait for the browser to throw an error. I get warnings and linting while I'm typing the code. I get autocomplete in almost every editor out there. This is cool stuff. And we share code on GitHub and help debug problems using JS Fiddle, JS Bin, CodePen, and all the others out there. Use these kind of things. If you have a JavaScript question, don't hurt yourself trying to describe what the problem is. Just make a JS fiddle that shows that error, put that on Stack Overflow or somewhere else, and people can then see what your problem is and fix the problem for you. So you talk to each other in code rather than in convoluted English that you don't understand, which is great to work with engineers from languages that you just don't understand. I work with Taiwan a lot, I work with China a lot, and it's really tough to, to type uh, uh, English, but when we just talked in code, it really works. Number three, removing scapegoats, IE is dead. Stop trying to pretend differently. My job going to Microsoft and why I, why, I, why I said yes to Microsoft was that Internet Explorer is now Microsoft Edge, an evergreen browser that is shipped with Windows 10 and is out there. And its compatibility was the number one thing we did when we built Edge. It's an HTML5 browser, but it also supports all the bad mistakes that other browsers had made because we cannot break the web. Internet Explorer is retired. It should be in the park feeding ducks. It should be a happy browser somewhere in the field and not be pushed, don't push animations towards it because it's not used to that any longer. It just gets sick. Internet Explorer 6 users are not used to beautiful interfaces. Don't give them beautiful interfaces. It would just confuse them. <laughs> and in essence, Internet ex or old Internet Explorers and old Windows versions are a security hole. They're not even a browser problem any longer. Like HTTPS is not possible in IE7 to a full degree, and that's a very terrible idea. The communications in Microsoft Edge are open and ready to answer your problems. Go to Twitter, MS Edge Dev, 
user voice modern IE tell us what you want to have in the browser. Status modern IE shows you what the browser can do. Remote modern IE means you can test uh, Edge on a machine that doesn't have Edge, like my Macintosh here, without having to install a virtual image of Windows 10. It's a Azure hosted Windows 10 image. And inside of Windows.com gives you cool stuff for Windows coming up. So we moved from Trident, which is the rendering engine in Internet Explorer and, uh, and, and older ones, to Edge HTML. And what we did is we, re we removed 200,000 lines of code. And that's not comment, that's like code lines. Six document modes are gone the way of the dodo, and 600 APIs that nobody wanted have been removed. This is good. This felt so good. The engineers were sitting there like, oh, I delete this thing that really I hate it. You know, all of us built things in the past that we want to go back and delete and we don't work for these companies anymore, so we're not allowed to, and we're just like, ah, oh, this has my name on it. And they were really happy doing that. And then we put 300,000 lines of code of uh, 55 new standards in there, and we were happy, and we put it on the web, and we thought everything is good. We got rid of all the crap you never should have used in the first place. VML, attach event, current style, render modes, IE layout quirks, VP script, <laughs> conditional comments, MS prefixed events, all the things that are weird and odd and why ever did we do them. If you have a company that relies on that stuff and you want to fix your website, there is a tool called uh, a Static Scan, which is on GitHub as well. So you can, it's, it's node based, so you can install it on, a, on your Mac or whatever. And you can type in a URL and then it scans it for you and shows you all the things that are not compatible with other browsers and accessibility problems. Like if you have white background with white text because you relied on a gradient that is only for, uh, for Safari, for example. So this is a thing that I use with clients a lot to show them like, okay, if you fix these things, everything will be fine in Edge and in Chrome and in Firefox and in Safari and in the next 50 browsers to come. It's a very, very simple way to find out what you have been doing wrong or the company you work for have been doing wrong. There's no more plugins. The browser is your runtime. Uh, we just realized there's no way you can, you can uh, keep plugins secure and there's no way you can innovate a browser if you rely on something inside the browser rather than the browser itself. And that is web-wide. Chrome, Firefox does the same thing. It's, it's over. Just write JavaScript. It's a good thing. So when we wrote a browser, we found a few things out. And that is developers have been breaking the web for a long, long time. Unwittingly, most of the time, I don't think you're going to be, ha, I'm going to mess with Internet Explorer now. But uh, we broke things over and over and over again. The first thing is we needed IE 11 in Windows 10 as well, as far too many websites rely on it, including all the internal Microsoft ones, which we're now trying to fix. Uh, so when a website is relying on Internet Explorer only things, uh, Edge gives you this interface saying like this website needs Internet Explorer and you press a button and it opens IE and opens the page for you so you don't lose much time over it. It's very, very hidden in the Windows thing. So we, we just, we're, we're not too proud of it, but it had to be in there. And uh, if you have internal systems that need IE, you can have a whitelist XML file where you can list all the URLs and that would automatically open an Internet Explorer so you don't have to jump through that like, please go to the other browser anymore. I wished we hadn't ha didn't have to do that, but there's 90% of the web out there that we just cannot fix any longer and people don't care about fixing it. So we didn't want to punish the end users for a new browser. So building a new browser <laughs> taught us a lot of things. I saw that, uh, I showed that before and I was very proud of it. And then I didn't tell you about that thing. 4,200 interop fixes. This means things that didn't work according to the standard, but worked in other browsers. So these are all the things that we had to put into the browser to make the web not break. What are these? Uh, the biggest problem was that we had a browser, we put it on the web, and we didn't get the websites that other browsers got. This is uh, an airline, I'm not going to name the name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> looks like this on Safari, looks like this on, in on Firefox, and looks like this on Internet Explorer. So even as we now had a browser that was awesome, we didn't get the sites that were awesome. We just get the site from the 1996 experience. Please kill yourself if you're trying to find that form field. So we faked it. We gave it the user agent of Chrome and sent it out on the web and then looked at the Hawaiian website and found the problems. Damn, I call it now. 
um, and found the problems and fixed them accordingly and put like WebKit prefixes and all kind of stuff in our browser until it looked okay. Then we did the same thing with the Bing crawler. Bing is a search engine, you can Google for that. Um, <laughs> we used the Bing crawler to in uh, index four trillion pages and found out what they had done wrong and we found it's rampant, it's all over the shop. And the problem was user agent sniffing. This is what people have been doing and are still doing. In other words, parsing the pack of lies. This is the user agent and this is what it relies to. So every time a new browser comes out, the user agent gets bigger and bigger because we have to be backwards compatible. Mozilla 5.0 is actually Netscape 6. Gecko 2010 is, uh, uh, is um, Phoenix before it was Firebird. Um, KHTML like Gecko is Conqueror, also bane of my existence, terrible browser. And all the others are becoming like Safari ones and we, we just copy and paste the thing in there into different browsers not to break the web. We found this wonderful piece of JavaScript where somebody tried to detect if it's a mobile browser. So if you want to note that down, here it is. This is one regular expression trying to find if it's a mobile device. Windows 8.1 on a mobile device was not a mobile, obviously. Because <laughs> like somewhere there was an error, we have to find it. <laughs> Stop doing that. Stop pretending that you can detect what browser is in use other than detecting features of that browser. Because the username is just a lie. You can turn that around, you can fake it, you can... Uh, browsers like, uh, like Opera told us for years that they're IE because otherwise websites wouldn't have shown up at all. You can't safely detect a browser. You fix your code in time and you fix your code in time and environment. You might as well code native because you write for one browser at one time rather than just writing for all the browsers out there, which you should on the web. And if you really need to fix an issue with a specific browser, if there's like a five pixel difference between IE7 and IE9, which of course will kill kittens and you, and you will lose millions of users because of these five pixels, make it by version number and by name. Don't make it by name, because the problem is if you just detect Internet Explorer and you put a fix in, then fixing Internet Explorer for us doesn't make any sense, because the fix would never show up, because you still show us the old stuff. Keep your helper tools up to date. Outdated libraries forced us to optimize old practices in the JavaScript engine. So, Moo tools, old versions of jQuery, old versions of um, whatever, uh, underscore, a lot of these things are have bugs in them that we had to put into the JavaScript engine to work around. And that's just sad that people rely on things and never update them. Shoddily written polyfills broke new JavaScript functionality and forced us to rename a new method. For example, in the, uh, uh, in the ES6 uh, standard, we had to rename array contains to something else because an old version of MooTools had array contains that was overwritten and broke the MooTools website. And we tried to contact those people, but they didn't want to change it at all anymore. Old libraries do browser sniffing and apply old syntax of now standardized functionality. So when I use the, the scanner with like clients, a lot of people say like, well, but I didn't write this. And you're like, yeah, you didn't, but it's in MooTools in that old version. So update the MooTools and then it will not be a problem anymore. I'm not hammering on MooTools, but we found a lot of problems with other libraries as well. It's just fun to say MooTools because it's like cows and JavaScript, which is always great. If you think JavaScript, think of escalators. Escalators are a great example for that, because escalators, when they break down, become stairs. They still work, they're much harder to use, but they still work, they don't block you out. A lift or an elevator, like Americans call it, if that one's broken down, it's just a very tiny room that's embarrassing to be in. But an escalator becomes just stairs that you can still use, and this is what you should think your JavaScript solutions as. Capability testing means you never deliver broken experiences. So, if thing, then do the thing. It's a very simple thing to do. Just do an if statement around everything you use and you will never give functionality to a browser that doesn't understand it. Uh, the BBC called that cutting the mustard, where it, they check for query selector in document, local storage in window, and add event listener in window, and then they can assume it's a modern browser, let's add JavaScript functionality, and don't give JavaScript functionality to the other browsers, which is the old IEs and like Conqueror and whatever crap is out there on the web still. Um, Jake Archibald found out an even shorter one. If not visibility stayed in document, then don't give it any JavaScript, because that one also rules out the old web kits on old Androids and so on and so forth. You can then layer on of that. You can say if visibility stayed in document, then if service worker and navigator and so on and so forth. So 
you never give something to the browser that doesn't understand it, which means you don't have to test in that browser, which means you have time to be happy. And you don't have to install 10,000 virtual images to, to test some browser that 0.02% of your end users have out there. Uh, number five evolve JavaScript itself. A lot, of, a lot of engineers never liked JavaScript because it didn't have classes and it didn't have the things that we understood. It didn't have the things they taught us in university, what life is like, which it isn't. But we just basically had to use it because we learned it for four years, so we have to do something with it. JavaScript has grown up. It's now an evergreen language you call ECMAScript. So it was ECMAScript 6, and then uh, JavaScript, as we call JavaScript now, is actually ECMAScript 5, used to be ECMAScript 3. ECMAScript 4 got lost somewhere. Nobody knows what happened there. And now we call it ECMAScript 2015, because they said every year we make a new edition of that language with new cool features in it. So you have a party every year when there's a new ECMAScript version out. It comes with so much goodness, technically it has to be fattening. There's so many cool things in that one that make JavaScript much like higher languages like Java, Ruby, Python, or whatever you want to use, Lua, uh, uh, Haskell. And all of these parts have different audiences. So it's very easy to look at ES6 tutorials and feel inadequate and like, oh my god, I have no idea what's going on there. These things are for different people. So you've got syntactic sugar which allows you to write shorter JavaScript, like arrow functions, for example. Template strings are pretty cool. You have client-side templating built into JavaScript now, rather than having to use mustache or handlebars or whatever. Uh, you got rest and spread and default, like default on function. I always liked that in PHP when I could say, like, uh, animal is cow, and when the animal is not set in my function, it will be preset to cow. I can do that in JavaScript now. You have let constant block scope binding, so instead of having a variable that you have to put into a, a closure to protect it, you can say let and it will only be do the block that the, that the variable is inside it. Promises, iterators, generators, typed arrays, and so on and so forth. And then you got really wild things like map set and weak map, proxies and symbols if you are a library builder. All of this stuff is in there and all of this stuff is cool. The support is encouraging. Microsoft Edge I is kind of leading. Chrome, Safari, uh, Chrome and Firefox are very, very close. Safari on iOS 9 is also there, which is cool, because everywhere else Safari is becoming this new dirty kid on the block that basically doesn't do the things that all the other browsers are doing. But with ES6, Safari is, yeah, we do that as well. Excellent. The problem uh, non-supporting browsers, <laughs> ES6 features are just syntax errors, like a fat arrow function in a browser that doesn't understand ES6, just like, eh, JavaScript error, not going to do anything, going home now, going to the bar, you do whatever you with your website. The solution is transpiling to ES5. Uh, Babel is the big one there. It used to be 5 to 6. Now it's called Babel because 5 to 2015 and 16 and so on and forth, they would have to spend too much money on buying new domains every year. So they just said Babel.js is the thing to do. And that one converts your ES6 into ES5, so it runs in every browser. The problem with transpiling is a few. It's an extra step between writing code and running it in the browser. And that was really cool about JavaScript. I just wrote the thing, I reload the page, it works. Now I have to reload the page, it transpiles, converts it into other files. I have to set up things on my computer to do the transpilation or you, uh, be connected to the internet the whole time. It's just not as much fun. We don't run or debug the code we write because the ES5 code that gets generated is different to the code that we write. So when you go into the debugger tools of the browser, you have to find a way to connect the error to the original line of code in your ES6. So that way you can use uh, source mapping and all kinds of things, but it just feels a bit icky. We're hoping that the transpiler creates efficient code. We don't control it, so the performance of our app might be completely different to the, co to the code that we've written. We create a lot of code. Like a lot of uh, conversion, especially when it comes to classes and let scope bindings, when that gets converted to ES5, it's a lot more code than our original code. So when we say it was 450 lines of JavaScript and it's like 6,000 lines ES5, it's not fun. And browsers that support ES6 will never get any. That's the biggest issue. We have all these cool browsers with ES6 support, but as we have to convert to ES5, they never get the code. So that way, we can never change the performance of ES6. We could feature test uh, ES6. There's a library called feature test.io by uh, Kyle Simpson. Um, 
this is a really good idea and I, I really enjoy using that because then I can just write the way I want to in my ES6 and only give it to the browser that supports it without having to go through transpilation. Of course there's problems with feature testing as well, it's an extra step that might be costly. We can only do it client-side because you cannot do feature detection on the server because you don't have the browser unless we get all browsers headless which would be really cool working on that. We can get false positives. Experimental features might be implemented in a rudimentary fashion. We had that with everything, with like CSS features, with uh, uh, web, uh, uh, web RTC. So a lot of the stuff that was in there is, is works, but doesn't work the way we want it to. It has the main object, but it doesn't have the methods that we try to access. And we have to keep our feature tests up to date and extend them as needed. Support for one feature doesn't mean support for another. That's a fallacy that a lot of people are doing. We can also use an abstraction, a framework or library that has similar features. Uh, type, uh, uh, um, TypeScript by Microsoft is a big one that allows you to write ES6 now and it is written in JavaScript so it converts internally to something else. Uh, Angular 2 is written in TypeScript as well. This was my shower in my old flat. Basically for six years I used that one instead of being clever enough to make a new one, but hey, it worked. Problems with any abstraction is that they make us dependent on that abstraction. So I become a TypeScript developer, I'm not a JavaScript ES6 developer, which of course is good for my CV, but not necessarily good if the company I'm joining does not use TypeScript. We can't control possible version clashes in the abstraction layer. People that relied on Angular 1 were bitten by that when Angular 2 is completely different. Same with Bootstrap 2, Bootstrap 3. A lot of times the new version means you have to rewrite a lot of your old code. And maintainers need to know the abstraction instead of the standard of ES6. So if you give your code away to another client, they have to teach their engineers what TypeScript or CoffeeScript or blah blah script or whatever script is rather than what ES6 is. So we have a conundrum with ES6. We can't use it safely in the wild. We can use TypeScript to transpile it. We can feature test for it, but it can get complex very quickly. Browsers that support it will not get any ES6 that way, but can use it internally. So internally ES6 is very much used in every browser. The performance is bad right now, that is normal. If you, if you make a language completely new, the performance will be terrible, but you have to test it. But we can't test it because people don't give ES6 to the browsers. So we're in this endless loop of confusion. That said, if you use JavaScript environment you control, please use ES6 and feedback to the experience to the TC93, which is the standards body that does JavaScript. It's not the W3C. So if you use Node, if you are in an environment where you know it's going to be the newest, coolest browser because it's on a mobile device that you control, only one company can do that, that's good. Use ES6 there and go nuts. You can help ES6 by looking at unit tests. These are the tests that every browser and every implementation uses. So if you find a problem in these unit tests, this will help every browser on this planet. They're on GitHub. You can learn and fix these issues. There's a great thing called eskatas.org, uh, done by some German guys. Uh, and that one is a daily test to go through one of these unit tests. That way you learn JavaScript by fixing problems in it, which is pretty sweet. It looks terrible because these are obviously developers that made design. There's the Babel.js docs that, uh, that uh, are fully, uh, fully explaining to you what ES6 is about. And it also has, as it's Babel, it has a REPL in there where you can just click on it and, and type your ES6 code and see what it converts to in ES5. So if you know your JavaScript and you wonder what the ES6 means, you can just do a, a direct translation between the two just by clicking it. So this is the REPL here. Of course, the heading wasn't linked. This one was linked. And then you can type something in and on the left-hand side you have your ES6 and on the right-hand side you then see the ES5 that it transpiles to. And that's also a really cool way to show somebody and teach somebody new things. I've done, uh, I've done job interviews that way. It's quite interesting to see. There's an excellent book that is available for free or you should also buy it by Axel Rauschmeier. Also great blog, uh, duality.de I think. Um, it explains ES6, but it is, not, uh, uh, it is not just an idea. It just explains all the problems with it as well. So that book changes every day at the moment. So it's really, really nice. He does a lot of work exploring ES6 really rather than just explaining what it should be doing. But he shows you all the problems with it, which browser supports what, what you can do to work around these issues, why some of the decisions in ES6 were made, and uh, so on and so forth. So in essence, 
JavaScript had had a bumpy ride, and there's lots of prejudices against it. It's a terrible language, you will never be able to write something, it never scales, it's always too slow, blah, whatever. Open your mind and learn how far it has come. Don't look at old resources, don't trust old people telling you that it's broken and you need to put Python in the browser or something like that, because JavaScript is here to stay, and it is the fastest growing language, it's what every recruiter looks for, it's even without knowing it. I love forgetting these job ads when it's like, yeah, it needs five years of ES6 experience. And you're like, it's a year old. Well, okay, time travel again, fair enough. But take a look at what it does for you and take a look and play with it and don't be discouraged if you break things because breaking things is a good thing if you know how to fix them. If you don't know how to fix them and just copy and paste things, you've made a mistake. And that's all I had. So with that, a hedgehog store for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>